Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. And for those who be sometimes listening on the line, uh, as Billy Graham used to say, may the Lord bless you real good. And so may the Lord bless us all real good here this morning. Our thoughts and prayers are those with, uh, with those who are unable to meet with us on Sundays. And there will come a time, <clears throat> there will come a time in God's purposes and plans when we shall all meet together and worship him. As we are gathered, Jesus is here. One with each other, Jesus is here. Joined by the Spirit, washed in his blood, part of the body, the Church of God. As we are gathered, Jesus, Jesus is here, one with each other, Jesus is here. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are here with us this morning, that this is such a wonderful truth. And we do pray, Lord, that each and every one of us will <coughs> hear your voice, will sense your presence, that we will go away from this building, from this church, from this fellowship, knowing, Lord, that you have met with us. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful blessing. Amen. <clears throat> Our opening song reminds us of two wonderful things. Things that we need to always remember, that it is God who is building his church. Isn't that wonderful to know? And also that he's equipping his church. So we're going to now hear, for I'm building a people of power. That's what we are, a people of power. <clears throat> the God in prayer. Let us all pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, again, that you are with us here this morning and that you are building your church. You are building this church. You are building all your people up in you. Lord, we thank you. We come together this morning. We bow before you in adoration and praise for all your grace and goodness that you shower upon us day by day. For all your faithfulness, your blessings, for all the spiritual blessings in our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, too, for the sure and certain hope that one day we shall be with you. We shall see you as you are. When you come again, we shall see you as we are, as you are. Lord, we thank you for all these great blessings. Lord, we just pray that you will grip our hearts this morning with the reality of these spiritual truths. Lord, we come to, together before you as we are. You, Lord, you know everything about us. You know our deepest thoughts and feelings. You know everything that there is to know about us. But Lord, we thank you that day by day you are watching over us and you are supplying your grace and your love, the things that we do need. Lord, we come to you and we pray that if, if we are feeling anxious this morning, that you will lift our anxiety, that you will drive away the fears, that you will help us, Lord, to, to know your peace, the peace of God that passeth all understanding. You, Lord, we bring before you all the members of this little fellowship, your body here. We pray, Lord, for those who are unable to meet with us. We pray, Lord, for Roz and Val and Anne and others. And once more, Lord, we bring before you Dorothy, uh, Betty, Walter Melling and Brian in hospital. Lord, put your loving hand, Lord, upon these people that they too, day by day, may know that you are with them and in them, supplying all your grace and mercy. We pray, Lord, for those at university, Anna, Natalie and Jessica, 
that you will put your hand, Lord, upon them and keep them in these difficult days, that you will continue to work in and through their hearts and lives, bringing them on in a, a real knowledge of yourself day by day. We pray, Lord, for all the people, for all your people <coughs> in Horwich today, those who will be meeting and those who won't be meeting. Lord, we pray that you will encourage them and comfort them in these testing times. For those who work in care homes and in hospitals, Lord, at this difficult, dreadful time, we pray that you will strengthen them and encourage them. So, Lord Jesus, help us to listen to your voice, dear Lord, this morning. Help us, Lord, to reach out in faith to you, to feel your touch upon us. Help us, Lord, to see you, Lord Jesus, and bow down before you in adoration and praise. We ask all these things in the precious and loving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the love of God is broader and wider than we can ever imagine. And this next song that can be played by Margaret now describes something of this wonderful love. We will never get our hands, our, our hearts and our minds around the, the wonderful love that we have in Christ Jesus. It's such love. It's, it's pure as the whitest snow. It's love that... Uh, stills our restlessness. It's a love that comes from all eternity and will stretch to all eternity. It's such love. It's such incredible love. And it's what we know in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> to say that we're living in unusual times is certainly an understatement of the year or even the century. We seem to be living in a world that very, very, very quickly has been turned upside down, or almost upside down. And as Christians, we are living in this world. We cannot escape this world. We're not impervious to it. And I wonder what we are feeling this morning. Perhaps we are feeling puzzled, discouraged, and perhaps even frightened. After all, we, we see the terrible effect of this disease upon the world, medically, socially, economically, and the terrible confusion and unrest that is all around us. And we feel the difficulty, we're wanting to reach out and, and serve people and meet them and help them in the name of Jesus Christ, but we can't. And we feel the restrictions upon our service as we come together. It's far from being ideal, but the thing is, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. That's the most important thing. So that's a restriction that we do feel. As Christians then, as God's people, how do we react to this thing that's going on at the moment, to these times, to these testing times? We know that there's only one thing to do, is that it's the one thing that we should always do and God's people have always done, and that is to turn to God and his word. Let us sort of narrow that down for a few moments and ask ourselves what would Paul say to us at this particular time? What would he be saying to us as a local church, as the people of God here in this place in Horwich? I think he would say something like this. The first thing to understand is who or what you are in Christ Jesus and rest and rejoice in your, in your relationship to Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. We need to understand and grasp in our hearts and minds who and what we are in God's sight and to rest and to rejoice in our relationship to Jesus Christ. We're going to turn very briefly to Ephesians this morning. It reads like a, a sermon with the greatest and the widest theme of all for a Christian sermon. The eternal purpose of God, which God is fulfilling through his son, Jesus Christ, and working through the church. 
This sounds rather complicated and abstract, but Paul here, in a wonderful way, he clarifies and makes it much easier for us to understand. There's a program on telly that's, that's headed, What Do You Think You Are? You might have seen it a few times. Um, what's interesting is the words, think you are. Because what happens, almost in every occasion, people go along on the program and they have some idea of the family that they came from. Very, very little or perhaps no idea of their family history. Only to be surprised and shocked and even saddened by what they discover. Paul wants you and me this morning to be absolutely sure of who we are individually and collectively in God's sight. Paul was thrilled and overwhelmed by what God was doing in and through Jesus Christ. What Paul was saying here in Ephesians is that as Christians, we are his people. We are his children. We belong to God. We're not some little eccentric society, some odd sort of society that meets now and again. That might be what people think we are. But we are the people of God. We belong to him. And what Paul does is that he, in writing, he paints three little pictures of the church, of this church here, of every church that belongs to him. At the same time, he says, it's a mystery It's a mystery. It's something that we'll never, ever get our heads and hearts round. But let us look at these three little pictures here in Ephesians this morning. Because each one has a precious insight into our relationship to Jesus Christ. First of all, he says that we here, the church that we belong to, is like a body. He says in chapter 1 and verse 22, he says, For the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Chapter 5 and verse 22, the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. We are members of his own body. We'll never understand it. But it's wonderfully true. We are members of him. We belong to him. And what Paul is doing and saying here this morning to us is one wonderful truth, and it's this, that we are united, we are joined to him. We are one in his body, absolutely and completely. And nothing will separate us from from him. Nothing that happens in our life as a church, as a company of his people, or individually, we can never, ever be separated from him. There is this vital, eternal link between ourselves and him. Isn't that wonderful to know? That whatever we're thinking, whatever we're experiencing, whatever we're going through, We are one with him. Jesus mentions this also in John chapter 15. He says the union is so real, is so vital. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And we're as closely connected to him as that. It's as if his life is being lived out in and through us. And Paul here touches on this also in his epistle. He says, we are his body. We are being filled by his spirit. His body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. His body, his life, is being lived out and worked through people like you and me. And we are called to be Jesus in the world. We are called to be his voice, his hands, his feet. So that 
by the grace and mercy of God, when people see you and me, when they meet people like you and me, there's something of Jesus that they see. And that's possible because of his Holy Spirit. Paul also says there is the head of this body and it's Jesus. And so in our service, in everything that we do for him, we are adoring our Lord and Saviour because he is the head of the body. Paul also says that not only do we belong to him, we are his body, but we are like a sort of building. He says in chapter 5 and verse 19, God is a home. We, we are part of a building. We are his building. We are his temple. And God is the builder. It's not Jack or Bob the builder. It is him. Nothing other than God himself. When, we, when people think, and perhaps we sometimes think ourselves, of the church as being just a building, it's just a place where we come in and go out on Sundays or whenever. But we are part of God. God is the builder of this temple of which we are part. And what Paul says in Ephesians is something quite remarkable besides that wonderful truth that God is the builder we don't have a first, fourth or third class builder. We have God, and God is building. God has built his church. He, has, he is building his church. And what is incredible about this building is, first of all, that, he ha that it has the strongest and the firmest foundation possible. Paul says it rests upon the apostles and the prophets. It rests upon all these wonderful people in the past, in the Old Testament and New Testament. But most of all, he says, it rests upon him. Because he says he is the chief cornerstone. He is the stone that's essential to the building. He is the stone that keeps the building erect. He is the stone that keeps the building online. And we're all part, we're all fitted into this building. Each of us are a living stone, as 1 Peter says. Isn't that wonderful to know that nothing can ever shake us? Nothing can shake this fellowship in this world, whatever might happen, because we are built on him. That's our foundation, firm as a rock. He also says that it's a building in which God lives. God is living in us, in this building. A temple in which God is quite at home. God is at home in you and me, in this building. Furthermore, he has a glorious plan and purpose for you and for me as his building. And it is to be like his son. In verse 21 of, of chapter 2, he says, It rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Isn't that wonderful to know that God is so wonderful, Jesus is so precious to us, that what he's doing is that he's working in and through us. And he's shaping us day by day into his likeness so that in belonging to him we belong to God and we share something we experience uh, what Paul says in chapter 4 and verse 24 true righteousness and holiness one more final thing about this wonderful building that we are in Christ Jesus this morning and it is this that it is never complete. This building is never complete. It is always being built. Now we would moan and think, well, it's about time this building was built. 
You know, you've been working on this building for a year and a half, and it's still not built. It's not, but God, God is, is building His church. And in the purpose and plan of God, that building will one day be built. Isn't that wonderful to know? We belong to a building that is continuing to be built, continuing to grow. And as that, the first song we sung, I think it was, saying God is building his church. We sometimes think, I think, that we, well, we've got to do this, we've got to do that in order to grow. There's some truth in that. We can't sit back and just say, well, let's just sit back and let's just see. But the most important thing is that God is building. God continues to build his church. And that whatever we do or don't do, he will finish the building. He will finish the job. Finally, Paul says, not only are we a body, a building, but there's a wonderful picture. And he says, we're like a bride. We are like a bride. In chapter 5 and verse 25, it says, God loved the church and gave himself up for it. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Isn't that a precious thing to realize? That this is the most glorious fact about us all, is that we have been loved. We are being loved by him. And one proof of that, of course, the supreme proof of this, is that Jesus died for you and for me. He died for us collectively, individually, when he died upon the cross. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Jesus loved and died for his church. Paul goes on to say why he did this. What was the purpose of his sacrifice? Well, in chapter 5 and verse 26, it says, to make her holy. To make her holy. Now, normally a bride, before the day or the evening, would do everything that she could in order to be attractive to her husband on the next day of the wedding. <coughs> she would put on the face cream and all the rest of it and try to new hair, hair done and all the rest of it to make her look really attractive on the day of the wedding. But what Paul says here is that as far as the church is concerned, God is the bridegroom and he beautifies the bride. It's he who makes the bride attractive, presentable. And that's the most wonderful thing, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing, is that God is so working in and through us that we become, in his sight, beautiful and attractive. So that we're out without stain and wrinkle or any blemish, as Paul says. We look beautiful in his sight. He is doing something for us that we could never, ever do for ourselves. He is making him, making us like himself. So this is Paul's vision for you and for me. This is who or, who or what we are in God's sight that we belong to him, that we can never ever be separated from him, that the life of God is working in and through us, that we're filled by him, that he lives inside us. We are his building and we are a bride and he's making us more attractive and beautiful by the day in order that we might be like him. Now, you might think that Paul was writing to perfect people. You might think, well, were these people up to it? Well, the answer is no, because in the second part of Ephesians, Paul makes it quite clear. 
to these people and to us here this morning that if we are his church, his body, his people, then this is how we are meant to be. This is how we are meant to live. Paul says, in effect, this is what you are in God's sight. Now live up to what God wants you to be. He says in chapter 5, verse 8, you are, you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. And the sadness, and it's a fact, of course, throughout Christian history, is that as Christians, as his people, we have not lived up to being the body, the building, the bride. And that has been, I suppose, to God's great heartache, that we haven't been, we haven't lived, we haven't served him as we ought. So this is Paul's message to the local church. This is Paul's message to you and me at this very, very testing time. He's saying to us, we're not just some sort of odd people. We're not just sort of strange, eccentric people. We we are, we can say this in all humility, in truth. We belong. We belong to him. We are his people. We are his church. We are being filled by him. And he loves us with an incredible love. And all of this, whatever happens in the world outside tomorrow and so on and so forth, whatever happens in our, in our individual lives, <coughs> nothing, nothing can alter this. So by the grace and mercy of God, help us to all to really seek day by day to, to live up to the challenge that Paul presents us. Because he says in chapter 4, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. (coughs) The calling that you have received. This is the call that we have been been given. This is the life that we've been called to. This is the, the experience, the, the joy, and the hope that God presents to us. Our final hymn, of course, must be... Lord, again, we thank you for calling guess, us yeah, any guess, into your any family. Guess, any guess what the final hymn could be? We, we the church are your body, your church. One foundation. That we belong to you, not for time, but for all eternity. Help us, Lord, now as we go out into this very, very needy world outside. Lord, guide us and keep us. Put your strength upon us and help us to live uh, for you and to serve you faithfully. Thank you again, Lord, for being with us here this morning. Amen.